Folks, before we start this episode, if you could do one thing, would you please hit that subscribe button? It really helps us out. You know, things like Bradley pulling off that whole opening bit of A Star is Born in eight minutes at Coachella, <clears throat> you know, doing it without, you know, a net. Those, those kind of moments are really exciting. You know, I was like, go! And we, he did the song twice, four cameras, in and out. We had no idea what we had. And it was perfect, you know? We'll kick those tires and start that virtual fire. It's time to camp. Today, we welcome an Academy Award nominated and an Emmy Award winning producer. He's done hit films like Gran Torino and A Star is Born, and his long film resume is even longer than the 26 mile marathon he probably ran this morning. He's the most fit producer we've had on the show. Please welcome Bill Gerber to the virtual fire. I love a virtual campfire. Right? I know. I mean, you're camping, you're glamping. What people can't see is that you're actually in a really nice tent that has the facade of a nice Colorado mountains home. You got it. I know. So we always have, to, we always have to start off here. Um, this is camping, you know, sort of. So do you have a relationship with camping? Did you camp as a kid? Do you still enjoy it? Do you, I mean, you're in Colorado, so I assume you love the outdoors. I love the outdoors, but I like having a house to go to after a long, cold day. Um, I grew up going to camp and doing some camping, but I never really turned into a camper. You know, as you as you know, I was busy playing drums that whole period of my life. So there was no point in playing drums out in the forest, you know? Well, I mean, sure. I mean, that sounds like a really cool setup, though. I mean, we could like drums in the forest could be a cool cool album concept I did, idea. I did re I did practice at UC Santa Cruz on the balcony of a rehearsal room. And I don't think people, you know, I got away with it. It's hard to listen to a drummer soloing in the, without a band. But um, I did that a few times. It was really nice. But there was a building behind me, not a forest. Surrounded by forests, but it was college. Well, I look forward to that. I think next time we meet, we should go drumming in the forest. I think that would be very fun. Um, okay, so before I get into your illustrious producer career, which I am extremely excited to get into, we have to go back. We have to do your origin story, right, for a little bit yeah. of Marvel here. So take us back. You're, are you from Los Angeles? Are you? Because I noticed you went to school in L.A., I am originally from uh, Nevada. My dad was in the entertainment business in Vegas. Um, he had all three of us, my brother and sister and I, in Vegas. Uh, he was working for MCA, which was Lou Wasserman's oh, yeah. uh, music empire. Um, he, Lou moved my dad to New York after that, so we lived in Manhattan for a little bit. And then basically kind of went back and forth a few times to Los Angeles, back to New York, settling in L.A. And that's when I went through the public school system in L.A. I went to West Hollywood Elementary, Emerson Junior High, Beverly High, which was a lot of fun. And then still California public system, UC Santa Cruz. Um, so that's the geography of it. Okay. Well, I'm just curious, too, like, what was L.A. like? I mean, I don't know how long ago this was. It was like, you know, 30 years ago, whatever, 25 years ago. But how's or L.A.? 50 years ago. How's yeah. I'm, I'm being nice, you know, but how's how's L.A. Yeah. changed? How was L.A. then or how has it changed? Oh, it, it, well, you know, it was really a charming little place back then, to tell you the truth. I mean, the 60s in Beverly Hills <clears throat> were very elegant. You know, I went to school with all the movie stars, kids and all the, you know, empire builders, kids of Hollywood. It really was a one industry town in those days. But, you know, it was a very small town. You know, everybody, you went to the same cleaners and the same market. 
nothing was big. Everything was very mom and pop. You bought your clothes at Rodnick's. You went shopping at Jurgensen's. You had brunch at Nate and Al's. Um, <laughs> you know, the flats are the flats, you know, sidewalks, people, parks. Um, we lived a little bit up the hill up Coldwater Canyon, but it was a really great little place to grow up. It was not showy. Um, <clears throat> you know, they, there weren't really Mercedes and things like that yet. You know, people drove Cadillacs, people drove Lincolns, um, a lot of dentists and doctors, as they used to say. And um, it was uh, very safe. And uh, the school system was very well financed in those days, just before Prop 13 and things like that. And um, it was very charming. I was very happy. And, you know, I'd come from New York, so not having to walk in the snow to go to PS 183 at the time felt like a big uh, step up. That's so cool about Los Angeles. I, my dad's from LA. He went to USC. I went to USC and uh, it's interesting. And he talks about downtown so fondly about, you know, and he actually said when he was at USC, the, uh, the film school was still was stables actually with horses and yeah. uh, downtown he's like it was such a cool it was the place to be and then when i was there downtown was not the place to be um relative when you to just, what year what year did you graduate usc 2008. oh uh i don't know anybody that young but anyway uh <laughs> yeah but beverly hills you know i was just talking to somebody about <clears throat> you know you'd walk into the market and the fruit would be glistening because they cleaned it all so much and they would do this little spritzer thing it was magic. And then, and you know, we had, I mean, where the Beverly Center is was like a pony ride. Beverly, it was called, I think it was called Beverly Park. We go ride horses there on Sunday, a little, you know, amusement park. It was, it was much different. You know, there was not, it's, uh, it was, it, as I said, it wasn't really flashy in those days. I mean, there were people with money, but it was low key. That's so cool. Was it, let me ask you too. I mean, I have to ask, how's the traffic? back then no i mean there's a train that went down santa monica boulevard you know it's all there was no traffic i mean the traffic thing is really like the last 10 15 years and it's exponential it's crazy you know you used to really say 20 minutes you can get anywhere that was a thing us old people would say 20 minutes you can get anywhere in la now those the bets are off <laughs> Man, that's, uh, I'm assuming there's not as much traffic in Aspen where you are right now, right? <clears throat> there's a little traffic, but if only if you have to go or come at a certain time. Otherwise, plus I walk and, you know, we I don't really use the car that much up here. Oh, man. All right, so you go to school with all these movie stars offspring. Did you, did that start, did the industry start rubbing off on you a little bit? Did you find yourself enamored with it a bit? Oh, no, never enamored with it. You know, I just wanted to play drums all day. And uh, but, you know, one of the bands we had was um, was uh, included a guy named Kerry Gordy, who was Barry's son and one of his sons. And we used to rehearse up at Barry Gordy's house, which was very cool. And there's actually some very early videos of us. Benny Medina, who went on to be a very successful record executive and manager. <clears throat> he was in the band and um, so, you know, it, the beauty of it was you weren't really uh, kind of, you know, intimidated by anybody because they were probably your friend's dad or mom, you know? So it wasn't, oh my God, you know, it's Lou Wasserman or it's this one or it's Barry Gordy. They were like, hey guys, what are you doing? It was just, you know, normal people back then. No gates, you know? No security. You got to I mean, rehearse. My next door neighbors, you know, my next door neighbors in my my dad, my mom and dad's house. It was really my dad's house, but my mom ended up with it, as most people do in divorce. Um, uh, you know, Marlon Brando was two doors down, and Jack Nicholson was one door down, and that's how wow. we rolled up there. Yeah. So let me get this straight. You were rehearsing at Barry Gordy, the Motown legend's house. Yeah. That's by the way, that's if it's any indication, we didn't get a record deal. So that's, I would, so that's how good you were. You were literally playing drums at Barry Gordy's house and you still didn't get a record deal. 
that's how that's how the band was. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, are with you... with his kid in the band, and we didn't get a record deal. So you had nepotism and proximity going for you. Wow. Go on, yeah, not really. Going against us. <laughs> That's I'm such a Motown nut. I I love I love. <laughs> I'm with you. That is no, so I'm working cool. on. I'm working on the digital capture of the Broadway hit musical "Ain't Too Proud." Oh, that's I just heard about that actually. I I watched the uh, it's an older doc, but I just watched the "Standing in the Shadows of Motown" documentary, and I'd never heard of the Funk Brothers. And man, when they get out and they break down what an actual track is, and they bring out the tambourine and the bass, and I thought, and it was so fun. So I started <clears> listening, <throat> and then my friend says, "You know, there's a couple musicals." There's a Motown musical and there's a Temptations musical. And I thought, I've never heard of this. It's amazing. Because that was my first concert. My mom took me to the, see the Temptations. It was, um, it was Otis Williams and um, it was Otis, right? Williams. And, uh, and uh, no, none of the original guys were left but him. And it was still amazing. And I thought, I've just been a Motown nut ever since. So anything to do with that, yeah. I'm all in. Yeah, no. So we're going to do a digital capture. We're going to shoot it in April with the original you know with the director of the show des mack enough it's going to be great that's amazing oh that's so cool um all right so you're you don't want to work you just want to bang on the drum all day and uh so music is your passion do you have any inkling that one day you're going to be in a specials is that the specials I'm not, uh, I just remember it's from my jock jams record i thought you might get that i do love throwing in a, a lyrical reference here and there uh it's on anyway, Jock Jams Volume uh, yeah, 1. I'm in school, I'm playing drums. I go to college, I'm playing drums. I come back to LA, I'm playing drums. And I decide not to go back to college, but keep playing drums. I'm in a bunch of bad, really bad bands. None of them are going anywhere. I know a little bit about the music business uh, because my father was in it a little bit. Not really. He was much more Vegas, uh, you know, um, lounge type of entertainers, which in those days was a big thing. You know, you play Vegas and Atlantic City and the Catskills and blah, blah, blah. And um, so a guy who had managed one of the bands I was in had this very cool concert promotion company called Fun Productions. I had done a brief stint in the mailroom at A&M. And after meeting people that had been in there three or four years, I thought, this is not the kind of trajectory I'm looking for. So I called the guy that was our manager. I said, look, you know, I know music. Why don't you let me come to work in the mailroom? He gave me a job in the mailroom. And I started learning the concert business. He also had a management company. And I started learning the management business. <clears throat> but the real success that I had there was because I had, you know, grown up a musician you know, all we did was listen to music, all we did. And I started suggesting some concerts to promote. You know, I said like, why don't we, we should do a show with Kansas, you know? And they were like, who's Kansas? I'm like, trust me, Kansas is big. This is right before, right around dust in the wind. We put the tickets on sale at the Santa Monica Civic, sells out, put another show on, sells out. So all of a sudden people are like, you know, oh, hey, what else are you listening to? Who else? So it was kind of like I was in a world that those people who were older than me who were listening to, you know, bigger bands, Aerosmith, this and that, weren't really thinking about. And they were successful and we made money. So we did, a, you know, I got to do, I booked the Bee Gees with the Brothers Johnson and a bunch of other acts. Wow. Stanley Clark, Stanley Clark was a big success for us. And... Um, then I quit. I was pissed off about something and uh, went to work uh, at a uh, record company called Nempra Records, owned by Nat Weiss, who was Brian Epstein's attorney, who, you know, Brian, the Beatles manager. And and there I learned, you know, more about A&R and promotion and marketing uh, of of records, you know. And we had some very cool people on the on the on the on the roster, like Stanley Clark and Steve Forbert. And then ultimately, we signed the Romantics, had a big hit with them. And so then I knew the concert business, the record business, 
a little bit about the management business because I worked with a band called Detective when I was still at Fun Productions, which was Michael DeBar's band, first band signed to Swan Song, which was Led Zeppelin's label at Atlantic. And um, I uh, uh, then got, you know, my first important job, which was I went to work for David Geffen's ex-partner, Elliot Roberts, who David Geffen had introduced me to, to replace another manager who had left. And, um, you know, I had a five year run with Elliot that was just amazing. You know, uh, he managed Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, uh, his, his partner managed Tom Petty, and yes, Tony Dimitratis. Uh, they gave me Devo to manage, and then I signed Heaven 17 and ABC and Scritti Politti and, and Pee Wee Herman. So we had a great thing going on. You know, not quite what David and Elliot had in the past with Jackson Brown and Joni and Neil and Linda Ronstadt and the Eagles and all that, but we did pretty well. And uh, loved it. And then got it, you know, it was from doing soundtracks. I met movie people and the movie people were like, what are you going to do next? And blah, blah, blah. And I was like, very happy being a manager. Then I got offered this job at Warner Brothers by a guy named Mark Canton, who I sold a project to. And um, I uh, thought, hmm. And uh, Geffen actually said to me, you should do it. You know, you should, you'll be a, you know, kind of a player overnight. You'll be a vice president at Warner Brothers. I was like, yeah, but I don't really know about the film business. It's, don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. And, uh, you know, I ended up there 12 years getting promoted successively. And and uh, that was great. And I love being an executive and I've loved being a producer. You know, I've been at Warner Brothers the whole time. All right. We covered a lot of ground there. Um, I have to go back, as you mentioned, besides Kansas, who is one of my favorite bands that you mentioned. Um, and yeah. we are not quite past the point of no return, if I may. Um, so I, I'm glad you see that. See what I did there? That was good, right? That was um, pretty good. Good yeah. pull. Before you carry on, my wayward son, though, I do have. Um, yeah, the first one was uh, Carry On. That was the first big hit. They were all. Oh, they were. Na, 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 na. Oh, yeah. it's such a great song. I love Kansas. Yeah. So you got to book the. Did you when you book these bands? Did you meet them? Did you get an interface with like the BGs? Did you get to connect with them at all? You say hi, you know, they meet 60 of you, you know, that that tour. So that makes sense. And, I'm, and I wasn't the boss, you know, they say so they meet the boss. And uh, can you see me? My thing just went to some other thing. Yep. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, you know, I meet. I mean, I didn't really want to meet any the Kansas or Ambrosia. Stanley Clark, I was a, I was actually a huge fan, you know, because he's such a brilliant musician. And I loved Return to Forever and I love Stanley's solo records so um but yeah so uh, the, who else did i do that with? those were the kind of the bigger ones that i did um and those all made money i did gil scott heron that did okay because i was i've always been kind of a jazz buff too you know but um uh so i was busy having fun i wasn't hanging out with the acts i was busy you know, meeting girls and doing things while the show was going on. I see. I see. Okay. Um, so, since you've seen so many amazing shows, I mean, you from drumming at Barry. I have. Bo I saw the Beatles three times. No, this is and great. And for those of our listeners who aren't sure what the Beatles are, they were an iconic rock band from the '60s. Um, so we'll have to. Well, we'll do. I don't be friends with those people. They we'll, don't. They'll all be the in the show notes. Um, if any of you are curious, what any of these. Um, aforementioned acts are <laughs> we'll get it yeah uh we'll do a bibliography yeah you've seen so many amazing shows um i know it's an impossible question but are there a couple that uh that stand out to you just like you're like oh my god that was an amazing show you know the stones at the hollywood bowl about 10 years ago just ripped my head off um bowie playing piano with iggy pop wow. at the santa monica civic where you just set Bowie as the Thin White Duke, you know, that tour, amazing. Um, some Peter Gabriel stuff was pretty amazing, but I actually, you know, I really liked the fusion jazz stuff, like Return of Forever and Mahavishnu Orchestra and stuff like that. That was, you know, that was powerful. 
That's awesome. Because I'm a musician, so I like seeing, you know, these assassins who can do stuff that's, you know, it's just magical. Um, but then there's, you know, the Stones get up there and all of a sudden they get in a groove and you're like, this is unbelievable. Um, did I have to Beatles, ask you, did Mick, The Beatles did... were cool, but you couldn't hear them, you know? The, the Beatles were great. Um, I've seen, uh, I have a lot of respect for Aerosmith. Oh, I have a lot great. of respect for a lot. I mean, you know, Paul McCartney, when he did the uh, minefield uh, benefits at the Beverly Hilton Hotel, he did one with Neil Young, he did one with uh, James Taylor. Those were beyond. Those were beyond. Um, trying to think of somebody younger, if there is, that I... Did you ever get to see... Uh, yeah. I got to see Prince. My mom flew me to Vegas when I was 15 to see Prince with my best yeah, friend. Yeah, I saw Prince a lot. I worked with Prince on a couple of movies. Saw a lot of Prince shows. I'm not, big, I'm not a big jam band guy, though. You know, I like to hear the songs, you know. Uh, but, you know, Prince was one of my top five favorite artists ever. Stevie Wonder, one of my top five favorite artists ever. You know, just live, you know, Stevie was pretty amazing. Um, I saw Blind Faith. I saw Cream. You know, I, I saw Zeppelin, um, Bad Company, Free, uh you know, because my dad was working at General Artists Corporation, so they booked all those shows, and he would get me tickets. And um, they were, I mean, I feel very fortunate to. That's one of the things about being this old is you've seen a lot of great stuff. Honestly, <clears throat> I don't think the, the last couple of generations, especially because of, you know, the iPod and everything, are having the same musical experience. My kids love music as much as I do, but their experience is much different. And you don't have the wonderful thing of opening up an album and not having heard it all on the radio already and discovering things. It was pretty good. Cool. You talk to any record people, they talk about that. You know, it was really going to Tower Records and buying a bunch of records oh, and going home, Tower was the best. Stone and listening to the record. You know, that was like, yeah, that was the internet or whatever. It was everything rolled into one. It was more fun than movies, TV, everything. So it's interesting. You hear you talk, and if someone tuned in right now, they might go, wow, we have a music producer on. And I, I, I share your passion for mm -hmm. music. When you were younger, so I'm actually, since we're going to get into this, and obviously this is a more recent thing, and I'm, I'm excited to hear the story, but had you seen A Star is Born as a kid? And did you ever think, oh, my God, I'm actually going to be the one to reboot this and – no, never. No, I, you know, I hadn't even seen, I saw the Streisand one and with Christofferson when it, you know, in the seventies. And um, I don't remember even how I felt about it, to tell you the truth. Uh, I like that one song, uh, you know, that Chris sang, look, look, don't look now or whatever it was called. Um, but uh, look backwards, now? what was it called? Anyway, <clears throat> um, no. I mean, I really became aware of Star is Born because I was working at Warner Brothers in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, we would talk about it as a great vehicle, like whether it was Lauren Hill or uh, Whitney Houston or uh, Aaliyah. You know, we're like, oh, maybe we should redo Star is Born with so-and-so, you know, every hot new girl that came along. And, um, and then I was actually talking with David Foster one day in uh, the nineties. We were talking about great music movies. He's like, Star is Born's the one. And I'm like, yeah, it's the one, isn't it? And then I went and started putting it together with Warner Bros. All right. Well, so you were at Warner Brothers and you moved over from music and you got into production there and then was before actually, because I do want to get into the story of a star is born. Uh, what what was the first project you got to do that was kind of your you got to steward and kind of shepherd yourself and is you it sounds like you were doing production on, you've done a lot worked on a ton of movies when did yeah. you kind of get to be the captain of the ship for your first time as like you're the producer your first one is like you're the one i mean it was i mean i'd done a couple of movies a little um you know some minor movies when i you mean as a producer not as an executive right yeah. Yeah, I'd done a few minor movies that were not really my, you know, idea necessarily. And then 
uh, and then I um, I just had the after 9-11 I just had this thing about making a uh, kind of a really American movie I just wanted to make an American red-blooded movie and for whatever reason Dukes of Hazard popped into my head and I was like, well, that's an American idea, you know? And so I called Jeff Robinoff and I'm like, we should do a Dukes of Hazard movie. Yeah. And he was like, great, let's do it. And I, so we got a writer, started out with um, the first writer. Uh, what was his name? John, anyway, long time ago. And, uh, and then I don't remember. Yeah, Jeff was still there and Greg Silverman came in. Greg really liked the Broken Lizard guys. We brought them in. They did a draft. It was very funny. Anyway, we figured it out. But that was the first time. And by there were no other producers on it, which is, with all due respect to people I partner with, it's really nice to just be the only producer. <clears throat> and I think the PGA and the Academy need to understand much better what produce, what real producers do <clears throat> and not give credits to people who don't really produce. And... Um, can I actually and, get you on that real quick? You said oh, what, a, what a producer actually is. That's, that was actually going to be a question of mine. I think there's a lot of confusion because there's so many. There's associate producer, co-producer, co-executive producer, executive. When right. You, when you, what is a producer in your mind? What is a producer? What do they do? Well, for anybody that has that question, I suggest watching Kirk Douglas and the Bad and the Beautiful, but which really <laughs> answers the question more eloquently than anybody could say. But... You know, I think real producers make movies happen. Like, would the movie happen without you? Um, probably not, because you're the one who started it and, you know, got your ass kicked 47 times before you even got somebody to say, okay, we can hire a writer. You know, you're not the person that comes on because you're a friend of the director and sit there and blow them, you know, blow smoke up everybody's blah, blah, blah the whole time you know it's actually the person who made the difference um in there being a movie or not and you know the, the you know the brian graziers and the jerry bruckheimers and the donald the lions and the denise denobis and the andrew lazars and the neil moritzes you know we actually do the work you know we dig down deep and get it done you know and then there's a lot of people who just show up and you know, they're glorified line producers or they're glorified business partners or they're glorified managers. And it's wrong in my mind for yeah. them to take a producer credit, take an executive producer credit, take a this or that. But producing's producing. It's a very specific job. Yeah, and it's a long, I think one thing I, I you know, as I dabbled in it and started getting into it and I really, you know, people would, um, there was a project I was working on and it took, 11 years i came in on year three and so they'd been working on this for a while and i would constantly get pushback from investors parts going you still working on that is it still taking you that long and i thought maybe something's yeah. wrong and then i i see this and i see where the star is born i mean this is it takes a long time i i when i see a movie hit the screen i feel like it's a miracle that's been that's happened by the way, a TV, in my mind, a TV commercial is a miracle. I mean, getting anything made is a miracle. It, it's, it's very, very hard work. And I, I see these people that are friends with a certain actor or this or that, and they go from movie to movie to movie. And I'm like, that's great for them, but that's not producing. That's being along for the ride. Yeah, I mean, it took a year to create a fake camping site in a bus that I'm sitting in right now. You know, that's producing, that's producing. building a bus. Yeah. You know, There you go. And yet you're still not in it. So I guess I'm not really a producer. I'm more like an <laughs> <Right>. EP, <laughs> so, you know. Uh, all right, so I am curious. So let's get to A Star is Born. I have a, I have so many questions about A Star is Born. That took a little bit of time and you're the producer and you're making it happen. So walk us through that. You, had, you said that was the vehicle. You said, all right, that's the one that's gonna launch this, right? That's gonna. Well, it's the one that gets me to be able to do all of the bring all my music background and my movie background and everything into the managing background, bring it into one, one film, you know? Yeah. All right. So what's the story? So did Warner brothers have this or how, what's the story of how did you Yeah, Warner it? brothers had made, you know, owned the rights from the beginning and made the first three. <clears throat> and, um, 
they said, great, you know, go take a shot at it, which we did. And we got a good script. Uh, a producer, Basil Iwanek, was working on it. We were partnering on it in the beginning. We worked on it, got the first script done. And then we moved, you know, I went, then it became Clint Eastwood and it became more my thing. And Basil <clears throat> gentlemanly kind of moved aside. And, um, you know, it was going to be Clint and then, we, then and Beyonce. I mean, there were a bunch of different iterations of it. And then it was going to be Beyonce again when Bradley came in. But, I mean, I've told this story a bunch of times. I mean, every movie, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood doing Dirty Harry was because Frank Sinatra didn't do it. You know, it's not, you know, these things are just funny. You know, they do seem to work out the way they should work out at the end of the day. If I told you some of the people that we talked about for A Star is Born, you know, and then you look at Gaga <clears throat> and Bradley. Uh, but, you know, Bradley is you know, just the perfect, you know, handsome, talented, da, 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 you know, like, that's not so accident. Gaga, you know, you think was obvious, but, you know, the studio didn't want her. She fought for it. She tested for it. She made huge contributions to the movie. But, you know, everybody could tell you stories about, as like I said, they're all miracles. Getting anything made is a lot, a lot of work. And um, when it gets done, it's a great sense of accomplishment. How did it not get and, done with Beyonce? I mean, I feel like you put Beyonce in it. How did it not happen? Uh, you know, a number of different reasons, creative, and then down the road, some financial things. But, you know, in a weird way, um, Beyonce, as perfect as she is, that's also a bit of a liability when you think about really the woman in our movie had tried to be successful and wasn't, you know? And I even said that to Beyonce at one point, and she was funny because she said to me, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. We, you know, Destiny's Child did Star Search and we didn't win. So even Beyonce had setbacks mm -hmm. in her career, even though she's, I don't know, all of 30 or something. But, um, you know, I just always thought she's so beautiful. How is she not gonna be a famous person? Like, where is the element of surprise? But we would have made it with her. She's phenomenally talented and it would have been a great movie, but Gaga really crushed it, you know? Totally. I, you're right. It does seem like an obvious choice now because she just, man, she just crushed that. And, but yeah. initially they, not everyone was sold on that though, right? Were they like, oh, this is, we love her music, but this doesn't seem like her. Was that kind of the opposition? <clears throat> they, uh, one executive in particular just didn't want her at all, you know, and the good news was the boss of everybody, uh, Kevin Sujihara, was like, hey, look, go do a test. You know, if you think she's right, you know, I mean, obviously they had a big deal with Bradley. They had a big deal with me. They said, go, to, you know, go see if it works. And, and then when we showed them the test, they loved it. So that was that. But, you know, it wasn't wasn't like, hey, let's offer it to Gaga. <laughs> it was a whole thing. Yeah. Um, now, I read actually, and you're, since we were talking about music, that one of the challenges with that film was, and the music was incredible, was to get those actual live audience reactions and concerts, but not release the music ahead of time and risk it being pirated. So, how did you guys yeah. balance that? Um, we're going to, we need the live concert because, you know, the live feel, but actually not subjected to being potentially you know yeah well on, on a technical basis we we just didn't project the music so it was all in uh you know ear ear earphones and uh 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 ear mics and um the playback monitors so it would be very hard to record it if you were out yeah. in the audience um and we were lucky in that like for instance when we were at stagecoach we got a big big favor from Willie Nelson to basically sneak on before his set and have eight minutes to do what we did, which became the opening of the movie. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. That's, wow, that's cool. Yeah. But, you know, there were 20,000 people there. And Bradley got up there, told them what we were doing, and they just went with it. You know, they, they obviously they dig him. And, um, and, you know, Lucas Nelson was in the band. And they got up there and the audience just loved being part of the movie, was happy that it was Bradley Cooper telling them what was going on. 
and it worked out. That's so cool. Wow, what a what a treat. Willie Nelson. It too. was fun for me. I had a, I had a concert promoter moment again because I was the guy. You know, I had Bradley here and my tech guys there, and I'm like. Are we ready? Are we ready? And he, Bradley keeps trying to go, and I'm like, hold it. We're not ready. You know, <laughs> like I felt like Bill Graham for a minute there. Man, so what did you do to keep pushing this thing along? I mean, did you, and how did you check your emotions in this? Because I know I have a lot of friends in the entertainment space. I've had projects where, you know, it seems hurry up and wait. You get close. You finally get a good script. You're like, is it going to go now? Do you have to keep a healthy distance, like emotionally with all these projects and just get ready for the no. long haul? I don't keep a healthy distance. You know, a lot of my friends are kind of pessimistic and, you know, they just go <clears throat> glass half empty and they expect nothing. They get plenty done, but their attitude is much more like that. I'm very emotional and, you know, I'm like fighting, fighting, fighting. So when it doesn't work out, I'm devastated. You know, I had a movie that we were out to an actor on and we gave him a deadline and he didn't answer us by the deadline, and I thought Warner Brothers was not going to make the movie because of that. And I remember just sitting in my kitchen, like devastated that this movie I'd worked my ass off on to get going. And this one guy just wouldn't give us an answer, and the studio was offering him a really good amount of money to do it. And it just, it was just devastating. I mean, it happened, <laughs> you know, thanks to Jeff Robinoff, it all happened, but. It was rough, you know? No, I don't do anything to protect myself. No, I mean, I, I can't imagine how many, like, how many times was A Star Is Born, did you get close, like, oh man, it could finally happen? Seven times, you know. By the seventh time though, you're like, or sixth time, you're like, okay, sure, I, I yeah, I'll wait for the answer. But you're each time you're telling me you would get excited, like, th this is it, A Star Is Born could happen? You know, yeah, I'm in makeup, as they say, every time, you know, I'm ready. <laughs> That's right. Now, was Star is Born, was that one that you were excited about because it brought all your talents, or was that something you were deeply, like, you felt you had a real connection to, and, like, was your, I mean, at some point becomes your baby? You know, it was less, you know, the story being emotional for me than the, the, the idea of the movie and the music, you know? I mean, I just loved making it yeah and in the end you know bradley so brilliantly directed it that i was i mean i cried every time i saw the movie which was after bradley and uh um jay cassidy i was the third person i saw it third most times and which was like sometimes four times in a week, I, I would go to a screen, you know, go watch the movie with Bradley and Jake and some of the other, you know, some of the other people involved with the movie, but I, but I was there every day. And um, then, it, I mean, it really, I mean, he did such a great job that, that I, you know, I'd lose myself in the movie every time, but I, I, I really liked making it. You know, it was one of those ones where I just, had a great time every day and Bradley watching him was really amazing. And, you know, they, they, it's great when they all work out and they're good and they're a hit and all that, you know, and you make some money. No, it's all, when you first heard the music, did you know, oh man, this is special? Yeah. When you heard yeah. Shallows? I mean, what you heard is a third of what we heard because we got rid of a lot of stuff. But yeah, when we first heard Shallow, that was big. When we first heard Always uh, remember us a lot this of way. Things, That's my you know, favorite one. Huh? My favorite is always remember us this way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, always this way and and um uh you know the the other song that um that Bradley sings in the drag bar um always not always um maybe I'm a maybe um what is it? Maybe it had seven titles. Anyway, that one, uh, My Old Ways, was great. Yeah. You know, so. That's great. Anyway, you know, we had a lot of people writing, a lot of people singing, a lot of people recording. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, Bradley, I mean, who knew he could sing? You know, he was in the choir for one year in Georgetown or something, and he delivers like a, you know, Emmy-winning <laughs> performance on the record. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, directing and singing, I mean, what a, yeah, that was such a phenomenal, such a phenomenal film. 
Uh, now, mm. I'd be remiss, obviously, an equally consequential film series that you were a part of in a different way is obviously the Harry Potter series, right? Um, and so, yeah, so. I'm, I'm not, you know, what I did was a lot, but very little in the scheme of things in that the movie would have been made, it would have been a big hit, it would have done everything it did. But the difference I made was it was at Warner Brothers. So, you know, it's not like Harry Potter wasn't going to become Harry Potter. But David Heyman had it early, um, and so we had a shot at it. It wasn't competitive. Nobody wanted it. Wait, nobody wanted Harry Potter? No, I mean, they ended up with a very small publisher in the U.S. It wasn't like a big thing. Wow. And then, and then Heyman got it, uh, and uh, he pitched it to a couple of our executives, and they came and pitched it to me. And I thought it sounded like a really good idea for a movie, but I can't. I know there are people who, who go, you know, back apocryphally and say, you know, <clears throat> oh, I had this vision. Not me. They fed, they had a vision. I, they weren't even in the room. But, you know, uh, it just sounded like a good idea for a movie. And it really, that's all you have are your gut instincts about these things. I didn't read the book. I had to make a decision right then and there, you know. And you hadn't read the book? No. The guys, the executives had read the book, but I hadn't read the book. Wow. But it was just funny later on to hear my former bosses talk about, oh, when we got Harry Potter, and I'm like, I don't, I don't remember them being there when we got Harry Potter, you know? <laughs> um, that's interesting. All right, tell me about uh, Gran Torino. Gran Torino is just a miracle, you know? Gran Torino, this friend of mine from the old days, used to run in D.C., Jeanette Kahn calls me, says, we read this thing. I read it. It's great. We agree. The only person to do it is Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood's agent passes on it. I'm devastated because I know it's perfect for him. And so I had to, you know, I really hadn't done this because I had a lot of respect for, <clears throat> you know, everybody's representatives and stuff. So I just went around the guy, got it to Clint and his producer, uh, Rob Lorenz. And, um, and it happened, you know, and it was just perfect. And frankly, from the time Clint read the script to the time it was in theaters was a year, less than a year. But there's only one Clint Eastwood. That's the only guy that could do that. Everybody else would be, oh, I'll do it after this or da da da. Wow. <clears throat> he just goes. Okay, I got it. So this is this is fascinating because this is part of being a producer, right? So you got to make it happen, right? There's the normal channels, which is you go yeah. through representation that's respected. Don't rely on the normal channels. That's the message. All right. So you, when you go around, what do you think happens with represent in general? Because obviously I don't want to pick on one person, but does representation just sometimes go? Okay, you know what? Like, sure. And then do you think he never? <laughs> I'll tell you what got they don't do. They don't do. They don't call you up and say, "I'm sorry, I should have listened to you." They concoct some story about how blah 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 blah, and they figure out a way to not have screwed up so clint do you think clint had not seen the script that you had to find a way to get the script into his hands yeah okay so reps are is that i mean again i'm learning here but is that part of the rep's job is to screen out things and they're doing because obviously i'm assuming they're doing what they think is best yeah you know exactly it's not like <clears throat> they're 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 trying to not get the client work they want to get the client work but they do have to use their discretion sometimes and it wasn't the script in this case it was timing and that Clint supposedly wasn't going to act again, so it was all it was all a an on a, an honest mistake, you know. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but in that film too, it seems like that wasn't a huge cast, right? It was Clint, and then it was a lot of was it a lot of new uh, actors and actors? Or, I or mean, folks? the kids had never had. There were non actors. Yeah. So was that part yeah. of the intentional process of it? Was that like to, is that what kind of gave it its feel? That's just how Clint decided to do it. You know, he wanted real Hmong people. So we had, you know, casting calls for people of Hmong descent and he taped them or actually Phyllis taped them. And then he picked them out. I mean, you know, he's not afraid of anything. <clears throat> you know, you tell him, tell him, well, that's a bad idea. That's all he needs to hear. It's a bad idea to hire people who have never acted. Watch me. <laughs> that's great yeah i don't know he's i he's just a workhorse and uh, man that guy's yeah see you are There's not only one. you can't compare anybody to him there's nobody like him nobody like him 
All nobody right. is good. Nobody is just decent and talented. And he's just, he's Mount Rushmore time, you know? That's amazing. All right, so message there. We got to get into some wisdom here. So as a producer or just in general, do you, does this extrapolate to business in general? If the normal channels aren't working, like just, you know, don't don't be afraid. <clears throat> Ruffle feathers, go around, do what you got to do, especially a producer, get the script to him. I mean, yeah. I mean, I haven't done a lot of non-entertainment business stuff, but the few things I've done, um, it's the same hammering away. You know, it's always at least in my life, it's always producing, whether it's managing or whatever. It's like your goals, what steps you have to take to accomplish them. You can't get disillusioned. You can't back down. I mean, it's it's a lot of work, you know, anything. You know, I don't, I mean, you look at, you know, you meet people who you think are easygoing, this or that, and then you, you like, you watch the Tom Petty do documentary that, that he did with Bogdanovich, you know, you go, Oh, Tom Petty, you know, he's kind of a hippie from Gainesville, blah, blah, blah. No, he's not. He's a ruthless, talented, you know, assassin. You know, he, he, he's like calculated. He's going to get what he wants. He's going to deliver. He's going to make great records. I mean, it's no accident. Man, that's so cool. Man, I'm still, I'm just processing all the stories, all the, all the people you must have worked with. Do you have a a crazy story or two or I don't know something mm -hmm. embarrassing or whatever that happened I, I imagine all the movies you've done all the sets you've been on there had to be a couple crazy occurrences or I mean there were all they, you know like everybody I've seen a lot of interesting stuff and I've seen a lot of crazy stuff um, I mean I had to once pull the plug on a movie that we were like seven million dollars into because I just didn't think the production uh was safe we had built some underwater vessel and i just thought <laughs> somebody's gonna die we can't do it this way and i went to terry semmel and i just said i don't want to do it and he's like well we need the movie and i'm like well i'm gonna i'm gonna redo the whole thing um which wow. we did it's funny somebody talked to me today about a asked me about a set we had built for this movie disclosure when i was at warner brothers and they were like, where's that building? I'm like, we built it on a sound stage. It was, you know, it was a $4 million set that we should have built down the road. And we could have, you know, really finished it off and had a great office building or something for people to use, but we didn't. We struck it when we were done with the movie. But, you know, I guess, you know, things like Bradley pulling off that whole opening bit of A Star is Born in eight minutes at Coachella, you know, doing it without, you know, a net. Those those kind of moments are really exciting. You know, I was like, go! And we he did the song twice, four cameras, in and out. We had no idea what we had, and it was perfect, you know? Wow, yeah. Wow, so you were building an underwater vessel and you had to pull the <laughs> plug. I imagine the investors were not pleased with that. Well, we were the, I was the, you know, it was Warner Bros. Oh, so it's a war of some. Okay, so yeah, that I imagine that probably is a tough call to make. <laughs> it was. That's what I was saying. I went to my boss and I said this isn't safe, and they were like, "Are you sure?" And I'm like, "I'm sure." <laughs> and we rejig the whole thing, and we shot it, but in a way that I thought <clears throat> we wouldn't be in a lawsuit over. You know, for young producers to be, <clears throat> what's your best wisdom for them right now given where the industry's going film yeah. today firing producers <clears throat> well, what do they need to do it's it's probably the same thing forever it's kind of the universal thing like find good material you know if you have something good odds are you'll get it made you know um uh so you know you can't make a good movie out of bad material you make a bad movie out of good material but your odds are better with the good stuff. So find stuff you love, whether it's a book, an idea, an article, a remake, a play, but stuff you're really excited about because it's probably gonna be a long haul until it's actually something that you're sitting on the set of. Yeah, and how do you keep yourself motivated in the midst of perhaps an 11 year battle to bring something to the screen? And how do you stay 
passionate for that. Well, you know, you're never, I mean, at least I'm not, and I don't think anybody else is <clears throat> only working on one thing. So it's kind of like triage, you know, the day starts and you're like, what's got the best chance of moving down <laughs> the field here? So you prioritize. Um, but, uh, but the overall attitude is I'm going to get stuff done. And, uh, one thing may go faster than the other or something I'm not even thinking about could move to the front of the line. But, um, you know, you saw that I did a lot of, uh, triathlons and stuff. And I, you know, in training for, it's like the same thing. You just have to, you have to build up your endurance. You know, it's, it's a long distance game, movies and yeah. streaming and all this stuff. So you need stamina. Now, virtually we've not done this yet. But right. it doesn't matter because some things transcend space and time, and that is a s'more recipe. Now, you are a, a extremely fit and perhaps the most active producer we've ever had on this show. Uh, what s'more recipe would fuel you to success, Bill Gerber? Look, the last thing you need is for another ad to tell you how awesome a product is. Yeah, super food, organic God. You don't need to hear how smooth it is. So smooth. Or how it features functional ingredients like lion's mane. Lion's mane. Lion's mane. Lion's mane. And I would never presume that my words could sway you into purchasing this most delicious brew. But seriously, buy this coffee. It's amazing. And it just might change your life. As a parent, have you often sworn that you want to minimize screen time? Let's be honest, you're going to cave. Why not let your kids do something useful on the tablet, like Vooks, the online streaming library of kids-safe, ad-free books that are read aloud to your child? Let's talk to two actual Vookworms. Vookworms? Uh, what do you guys think of Vooks? Oh, wow. That's... That's amazing. I can actually do it way, way, way better. Uh, that's, that's probably not necessary. That's my... All right, Jeb, do you like books? Yes. Oh, yes. Jeb. Yes. What's the last book that you watched? You're not scared. I am not scared. What are you scared of? Bad guys. I'm scared of spiders. If I'm a friend with, with spiders, I will like it. Fire. Max, it's your turn to pick a book. Ruckus on the Ranch? What's that about? Causing a ruckus on the ranch. Causing a ruckus on the ranch. Do you actually read the words? Yeah. Is that why you're so smart? No. No? <laughs> what would you... <laughs> you're causing a ruckus on the set. You're causing a ruckus on the set. <laughs> Head on over to join.vooks.com forward slash redeem and our promo code went camping for... $25 off your Vooks subscription, which is basically six months of free Vooks. That's amazing. Do it now. I would want a graham cracker, dark chocolate only. Mm -hmm. I'm f and I would prefer that the marshmallow be buttercream. Interesting. Yeah. Buttercream. Do they? Is there a brand that does that? I've never even heard of that. I don't think there's a brand. You just make it. There you go. So we're producers. We're gonna go make buttercream marshmallows. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Producing is finding the person that knows how to make the buttercream. You don't make the buttercream. <laughs> That's right. But then we get the award when our s'more yeah. wins the recipe, right? No. In the words of the great wine, uh, Jerry Weintraub, you know, there's always a guy. <laughs> always a guy. All right, that's great. I imagine you probably don't do it. Do you, do, you probably don't do a ton of sweets given your healthy lifestyle, right? I like sweets. I like sweets. I don't do a ton of them, but I like them. I mean, you run 26 miles, bike 50 miles, or bike 100 miles, swim, whatever it is, five miles. I feel like you've earned a 
a not carb often. or two. Not You've earned often. a carb or two. <laughs> I have done all of that. I didn't do it today. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. All right. Now, since you you keep mentioning that you've been on this earth just a slightly longer bit of time than I have, so you have had some right. time to accrue some experience. Have you ever <laughs> had anything? We are by a campfire, so we need to ask: Have you ever had anything otherworldly, spooky, perhaps mysterious? Rod, Sir channel your inner Rod Serling. Well, otherworldly all the time because I do think. <clears throat> you know, I think the universe does conspire for you in many ways. But um, I knew you were going to ask me something about this. And I remembered that when I was growing up in that house on Mulholland Drive, there was a, uh, <clears throat> you know, an urban legend about a man who had escaped from jail and he had a hook for one hand <clears throat> and somehow was on Mulholland Drive and there was some car that had pulled over for some kids to make out. And, you know, he hooked the thing and whatever, mayhem, <laughs> murder. But like living on Mulholland Drive, I didn't park on Mulholland Drive ever. You know, like it always occurred to me about this guy with a hook and it was scary. <laughs> wow, so but to, for the record- That's all I got. For the That's record, you have not seen Captain Hook or interfaced with him. No, I haven't. You know, and the thing is, I don't, I don't operate with a lot of fear. Like, you know, you're shooting in New Orleans. I, you know, I was. I, I mean, I inter, I interact with everybody. I end up meeting a lot of people. I feel pretty safe in most places. You know, I made it 63 years so far. Hopefully, I'm not making any more mistakes in the future. But um, so. I'm I'm like very comfortable on the planet. Yeah, well, you're in Colorado too, I imagine. Do you have? Uh, are there threats of wild animals there? Do you have bears yeah. or? No, there's bear dens right down the hill there. Wow. Even are they relocated bears from California, escaping high taxes and oppressive no, regulations? No, California ones are dangerous. No, these guys are vegetarian. Apparently, I'm told. I hope it's true. <laughs> and. Um, I ran into one on a bike ride when I first moved up here. And, uh, you know, you can't outrun a bear. So I was coming down the road, nobody around, you know, it was like, you know, middle of nowhere, coming down on my road bike. He's right in front of me about mm, 50 yards in front of me. I start breaking and I'm going, okay, what do you do? Do I go get bigger, start yelling? turn around and try to get away and um he turned around and went that way so i was thrilled that was my big bear encounter so far all right well did you tell him you also you're a producer right did you you could have name dropped right i could have said you know yeah i know clint eastwood or something yeah, clint eastwood bears run away from clint eastwood right everybody runs away <laughs> oh man all right so as we right. come to the as the as you mentioned as the light goes down we got to come to the deeper parts of our of our talk here in addition to having produced so many films you've also co-produced uh some children as well it sounds like yeah and family uh i'm curious how do you balance uh family life and being a successful producer and how much work goes into that obviously hollywood has the trope that like you can't ever do both but you know you've managed to do both like how, do, how does that work yeah, i mean meryl streep's got kids you know i mean you can do it obviously um you know joe roth was uh, coaching uh basketball bob Iger coached whatever basketball who knows what else you know i mean those guys had you know Iger had an enormous job i never had that big a job but you know, you, you got, if you want to do it that way, you can do it that way. I mean, there's planes and there's all kinds of ways to, <clears throat> you know, move around. I'm not a director, so I don't have to be, you know, doing a shot list Sunday morning. You know, the director's doing that and, and the director probably flew his family in or whatever, you know. When my kids were locked into school and all that kind of stuff, I'd go home on the weekends all the time, you know, whether it was Toronto or New Orleans or whatever, 
you know, I would go. And then when I had to shoot in South Africa, they came down and we made it kind of fun and did safari and whatever. So if you want to make it work, you can make it work. I mean, we're lucky in that way that we're paid well. The budgets are normally pretty good. Um, none of us are really having to end, make ends meet to raise your family. You know, they're all at a private school. I mean, this is a, you know, a very, you know, uh, uh, privileged uh, business. And so, you know, unlike people who, you know, have to leave their families to pick strawberries, you know, we're, we can get on American Airlines and go home for the weekend. So it's just about intent and desire. Yeah. And if you are as in love with your kids as I was, you'll get home. Totally. One way or the other, you know? I just wanted to. People used to say to me, oh, you're such a good dad. I'm like, I do it for me. You know, I mean, I, I want to be with my kids. I'm not doing yeah. anybody a favor. It's, it's the way I want to live my life, you know? What's, uh, what's the best part of fatherhood? Well, it's all pretty good. Um, it's all pretty good, I guess. You know, when you least expect things and, you know, what, you know, one of your kids is like, I just want you to know I love you or I just want you to know I appreciate this. Or sometimes it's like, I want you to know I'm sorry I said something. It's those vulnerable, honest moments for me. You know, I mean, I never I never had like, oh, my kid better get straight A's and go to Harvard. You know, I just wanted them to be happy. And so as long as they're happy and they're good people, yeah, I have all girls um, and they're really good people. Uh, and my wife, ex-wife was a great mom. So that all turned out pretty well. Yeah. Um, what do you want your daughters to, is there something you you know, you really wanted to stress to your daughters or impart to them? Obviously there's a whole, I imagine, slate of parental wisdom and values one instill, but were there things that you're like, you really went, tried to go above and beyond to really instill in your daughters? I mean, I think what we went above and beyond was to recognize what they were passionate about and be supportive of it. You know, whether it was horses or dancing or volleyball um, or academics, uh, you know, it was for them to find some passion uh, cause I had met a lot of my friends, kids who were my friends who were older than me, whose kids just seemed kind of, you know, rudderless. And, uh, and it was before I had kids and I thought, well, my kids, <laughs> when I have kids, I'm going to so encourage whatever it is they're good at or want to do. And I think that that, that was, that was great. And, you know, I come from, I would say good values, not necessarily the best behavior in terms of what I was, you know, witness to growing up, but good values. And we were very good people, you know, and we instilled good values in them and they're honest kids and they're hardworking kids. And uh, I mean, 26, 24, 19, you know, not really kids anymore, but you know, they all work, they all did well in school. They have great relationships. Um, you know, just be a positive example. And, and, and I also wanted them to know about chasing dreams and working hard and, and not giving up and, you know, and having girls, you know, my thing was don't believe that there's anything you can't do. You know, girl can be president of the United States, girl can be an astronaut, girl can be whatever, you know, I mean, Emma was born in 94. Um, you know, that's a little bit, yeah, that's 26 years ago. I mean, now you have a female vice president. We almost had a female president, but that's just in the last, you know, eight years. So um, it's, uh, it's five years. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a different world in, in, in many better ways, so. Yeah. Um, this is one of my favorite questions I've enjoyed hearing the answers to over the months we've done this. Is there someone or a group of people or anyone who in your career or just life gave you a big break or took a chance on you that you just, you owe and you're like, I can never repay this person, but they're instrumental to my success? Yeah, I mean, my dad, David Geffen, Elliot Roberts, 
Mark Canton in a weird way. Um, <clears throat> many people, you know, I was very, uh, Nat Weiss, I mean, I was very fortunate um, to be helped and guided along the way, you know, but at the end of the day, and I, that's why I mentioned my dad, you know, you have to have certain examples of how to navigate stuff. And my dad was very good that way. And he also taught me a lot of restraint, which, you know, not saying something can be very important. And uh, so, yeah, those people and others. That's great. All right. Last thing I want to do, I want to get a quick clip of this into our producer, just Don. I mean, this would be a good little promo clip for us. Um, as a producer, an Academy Award nominated Emmy Award winning uh, producer, what is the number one thing you look for in a script? Is it a feeling? Is there something that happens? How do you know when you've got something special? I mean, it's an instinct, you know, and I think coming from music, you know, they used to have that old thing on American Bandstand where they would say they play a record and the kids would say, I give it a, you can dance to it. So I give it an 87 or whatever. And I really feel like my, I can't speak for anybody else. My instinct is very much a gut thing. When I read something, even if the writing's not perfect, it's a great idea and it feels good in a certain way. Uh, Grant Trino is well written, but that's a perfect example of just, it's working, you know, this thing's working. I mean, Clint didn't change a word of the script. You know, he shot that script that Nick wrote. And um, it's just gut, it's just gut instinct for me, you know, and I really like reading, especially when it's good. And um, I love being surprised when I read a screenplay. But you know, it's funny, I think everybody who's been doing this a long time will say the same thing, which is every time you open that cover page or open that PDF on your computer, you're like, maybe this is going to be great. You know, you don't, you know, I go into it with a lot, lot of optimism. That's right. So it's like you would say that about this show, right? It's like you, this interview, it works, you know, it's good. Perhaps <clears throat> a star is born this day. You know, I think all those are apt descriptors, correct? I'll just go with yes. Okay. That's good. All right. Goes, he went in optimistic. That's what we learned. So yeah. that's, <laughs> that's good. The most things. That's right. That's right. Well, we're just, we're making it right. That's the most important thing. I did have a mentor say first step being a director, producer, go, go make something like right now. And you've got a mobile, yeah. st you've got a studio in your hand and your iPhone can do things that no write one it can out, do. write it out, fade in, you know, whatever. That's you just right. got to do it. Interior, expensive bus in a quarantine post-apocalyptic California. Two people sit virtually over a campfire. Yeah, behind me. Yeah. That's right. That's right. A vegan bear looms in the background, right? So. <laughs> Hopefully. They're not all vegan. Well, we appreciate you being our first virtual campfire guest. We are proving sure. that technology can keep us uh, keep camping, even though we're miles, separated by miles. I'll see but... you when we have the next thing coming out. We'll talk about it. That's right, man. Well, hey, we're so grateful. Bill Gerber, thank you for all your wisdom. Appreciate you joining fun. us. Happy to be supportive of your thing. And uh, <laughs> remember me when I'm old. I will never forget you. I trust me. All right. Thanks for joining us, folks. If you want to help us out, and we're confident you do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. And if you ever feel like just listening to these, you can check us out on all major podcast streaming platforms by just searching for I Went Camping With. And there, you should also subscribe. Thanks again, folks.